These are the sounds of my childhood. Listening to these sounds brings me back to my innocent early years of the 70s and 80s, when all I cared about was action figures, Star Wars, and video games. That's because I grew up through the dawn of video games in the United States, and this is my life through video games. I was born on February 4, 1974. At the time, video games were just hitting the U.S. market, with Atari releasing their hit Pong game in September of 1972. The game was sweeping the nation, leading to numerous others, but none were as popular or important for me as... Asteroids. Space Invaders. Or the king of them all, Pac-Man. I was in love with arcades and the games they held. I would beg my mother for quarters, and my fondest birthday memories come from visits to the arcades with five dollars worth of quarters for each of my friends and me. But as generous as my mother was, visits to the arcade were all too rare for my video game appetite, until one day. Pong. The game that started it came to town. I don't remember whose house, but I remember standing in a wood-paneled basement, watching amazed as a real video game played on a real TV. This may not look like much, but it was the most advanced and important step in video games yet. It brought a real cabinet game into the living room. I did not have it, but I wanted it. I would never get my wish, but I would get something better. In 1980, I was in first grade, coloring with crayons and sharpening my new reading skills. In Christmas of that year, the arcade came to my home. It was the Atari 2600, the first major video game system for the home and the sensation for children across the United States. At last, I could play video games in my own house, whenever I wanted, with no quarters. And those games started here, with combat. This is combat. It was simple and unsophisticated, but then so was I. We were a perfect match. And here, in adventure, I played a dot, exploring a land with dragons that looked like demented ducks. Yes, it was ridiculously simple in graphics and gameplay. But it was fun. This is Circus Atari, my mom's favorite. You had to move this seesaw to bounce the guys up and hit balloons. She called it splat because, well, when the guy hit the ground, he made a big splat just like that. Laughs and laughs. I spent hours on the strolling adventure of Pitfall. And I brought my beloved asteroids home for game after game of mineral destruction. The king even visited in the form of Pac-Man for the Atari. Now we all admit it, this game was horrendously awful. It probably killed Atari, but I did not care. I was a boy in elementary school. I wanted to be Luke Skywalker and I wanted to eat blue ghosts. I didn't care about the fine details. The rest of the United States, though, was a different story. In 1985, after disasters like their Pac-Man release, Atari neared collapse, with the rest of the home video game world following suit. I was getting ready to leave elementary school for junior high. A new life for me. And a new life for video games. Welcome to the stage the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES. Despite the decline of the market, Nintendo stopped making games for other consoles and released their own. It was the first 8-bit system and boasted better graphics and more sophisticated gameplay. And of course, it had... Mario. Super Mario Brothers was the smash hit that propelled the NES into stardom. 
At first, I was only able to play the game when we rented the entire system from our local video store. But in 1986, as I was sitting in 7th grade, my parents bought one for me. Now, I could play Mario. And The Legend of Zelda? And Castlevania. And of course, my favorite. <laughs> Metroid. I cannot tell you how many hours I lost in this alien maze of mutants, finding hidden doors and perfecting tricky jumps. Metroid and all the games on the NES were not just better looking, they were smarter and harder. The games told stories and created intricate worlds to explore. In school, I had traded in my crayons for pe pens and my blocks for a calculator. On my television, I traded single screen play fields for infinite screen mazes. The games were growing up, and so was I. But as these games grew even more, they were about to take a much darker turn. In 1989, Sega entered the home video game market with the Genesis system, a 16-bit development from the NES. It was faster and even more sophisticated. So was I. Now a high school student and just a moment away from the freedom of a driver's license, I was feeling powerful and aggressive. So this was perfect for me. Street Fighter II for the Sega Genesis. It was one of the best and most important fighting games of its time, a time filled with fighting game after fighting game. I did not own a Genesis system, but my brother did. When it came home from college, he would bring it, and the punches we traded in real life as children became a vicious virtual reality on the Genesis. A reality even more vicious with... Mortal Kombat. This game, with its bloody fatalities and bone-crunching sounds, drew fire from critics everywhere for its violence. And yes, it deserved the criticism. It wallowed in its violence, and I wallowed with it. After all, I had a lot of growing up to do before I would stop being a know-it-all teenage boy. Yes, it had to happen eventually. I graduated from high school, graduated from college for the first time, and found myself in graduate school in 1996. And just the previous fall, on September 9, 1995, the Sony PlayStation was launched. Breaking from its partnership with N Nintendo, Sony created a game system that would surpass all expectations. By the time I bought one, with my first credit card, 2 million units had been sold in the United States. I bought mine for $199, which was coincidentally what my parents paid for that first Atari 2600 game. Of course, if this were 1980, that $199 would have actually been $104.51, Quite a price drop. On the PlayStation, I still saw my share of violence with... Resident Evil. And I still gloried in fighting one-on-one -on -one with... Twisted Metal 2, the demolition derby that took the world with it. The crowning achievement of this period was Tomb Raider. Laura Croft hit the scene and stole my heart with her Indiana Jones adventure. It was exciting, frightening, and totally immersive. With Tomb Raider, I had reached a pinnacle that I had never reached again. I felt totally buried in a video game world. It is still the only game that I have bothered to play through multiple times. But that was it. Video games kept evolving, but I stopped following them. I had followed them from before I could read, but I stopped once I grew into adulthood. These games had stimulated my thoughts, excited my heart, and comforted me in a way that I cannot express fully. They will always stand as the measure and record of my childhood and growth.
Lucky for me, anytime I want to relive those days, I only need to press start. 